James, super good to see you again. Thanks for joining me on the Mark Divine Show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, I really enjoyed our conversation a few weeks ago. I mean, it's neat that you live right up the road from me, so it's fun to hang out and in your little Zen garden, which I now understand you're you're leaving behind for greener pastures. Yeah, yeah, no that that conversation was a blast. I um, really enjoyed getting to geek out about consciousness with you for a couple of hours. Yeah, yeah, it's not often you get to, to talk about consciousness and psychedelics and meditation and and uh, and where where humanity is going. With right. the very smart individual. So I always treasure those moments. And so yeah, maybe we'll get to talk about some of that today, right? And share some of our insights. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine some of that will come up. Yeah. Now, um, you know, I, I always like to start kind of like getting a sense for where my unbeatable guests, you know, get their kind of source material. Like their what's the origin story of James Smalshenberger, like where did where were you from? What were your parents like, and and why why did you grow up to be kind of the way you were? Where you're fascinated with the this intersection of human potential and longevity and and entrepreneurship? Mm. Yeah, no, good question. Um, so I, I had a pretty we'll call it non conventional life growing up, um, and you know, a lot of really extraordinary opportunities that I think significantly shaped who I am today. Um, I mean, for one, I I know you're familiar with transcendental meditation. Yeah, Um, absolutely. And so I kind of grew up in that world. Like I was born in- Were your parents part of it or how did you get introduced to it? Yeah, a little bit before I was born, my parents had moved to Fairfield, Iowa, where there's a university that was started by Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, who's the same man that founded TM. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they both were working with the university. What's that uh, called again? I remember, uh, taking a look at that once, but what, you remember that? What's the name of that? Yeah, it, it was different back when I was living there, but now it's called the uh, Mahish University of Management. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. They did change the name. Yeah. I think it was originally Maharishi International University. Um, but because of the fact that there was an association with sort of yogic practices, they wanted to more professionalize it and move in a management direction, despite the fact that, you know, the education actually covers a much broader gamut than that. Right. Maharishi's Uh, contribution to meditation in this country is extraordinary. Most people don't really understand, like almost all the research, you know, from the last 30, 40 years came from his organization, the scientific evidence based on the health benefits and the emotional benefits and the, even the cultural benefits of meditation. No, I mean, it's actually, it's one of the things I really appreciate about that space is, I mean, obviously there's all kinds of different meditation and mindfulness practices that right. from a you know personal subjective perspective, you can tell that they have a real benefit, but most right. of them don't have anywhere near the level of research that actually explains why the benefit is happening and sort of m- measures it. And I right. think that the work that they did really did a lot to legitimize the whole space of meditation and mindfulness and then kind of led way to other practices being able to become more popular as well. Right. Yeah, I agree. So, so your parents got involved in uh, TM and then you just kind of grew up with it and started meditating with your parents. How did that work out? Yeah. I mean, I, so I was born there, so there was obviously a lot of influence around not just meditation, but, you know, consciousness in general, um, a lot of study of enlightenment. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I learned, how to meditate when I was five. Um, that was a different practice, right? There back then it was like a walking meditation for kids so that you could right. stay a little bit more engaged. Um, and then, you know, I learned more of like the traditional uh, version when I was 10. I don't think you're actually supposed to learn until you're like 15 or 16. And no, I, I would think not actually. Yeah. Cause yeah. The, the, the brain isn't quite developed enough to really kind of hold on to the mantra and, and the different, you know, techniques. It's interesting. Cause I, I ended up getting like officially taught by like, you know, proper teachers, I think when I was 16. Mm -hmm. Um, And, but I had been taught previous to that um, in just sort of a non-official capacity. And I don't know, I had phenomenal experiences young. Like I remember, you know, 10, 11 years old, I just loved meditation. I would do it all the time. And especially then I would sort of routinely have experiences of Samadhi. Mm-hmm. Um, no kidding. And that 
you know, I mean, have, that's, you're the, probably the first 10 year old in America to have those experiences. <laughs> I, mean, uh, awesome. I was probably one of the few who actually knew that word, at least the right? 10. Uh, yeah. I, you know, I was definitely fortunate to get some, some interesting exposures. Um, but yeah, I mean, so, you know, meditation, consciousness, like these were really heavy influences in my early life. Uh, but additionally, like I was homeschooled for most of my life. Um, mm -hmm. And I did go to school off and on for a few years because my parents wanted me to have that experience and have mm -hmm. sort of the social engagement that came. Mm -hmm. But a lot of my time was homeschool and the nature of how that was approached, there wasn't a set curriculum. Um, mm -hmm. Like the philosophy that my parents came to it with was that their job wasn't to teach me. It was to un like to be able to understand what I was innately interested in and mm -hmm. be able to facilitate that. And then you know, where there was a need to learn specific kinds of content, it was predominantly taught through the lens of whatever I was already interested in. Like I remember when I was, I love that. and you know, it's interesting now, like one of the, that, that's by the way, is starting to prove to be like the fundamental and best way mm -hmm. for an individual to learn. But there's very little research that's been done into it, but there's a shite ton of research into the traditional model that proves right. that it is somewhat effective, right? At, at teaching, you know, content and, and learning methodologies. Um, it, it is good to see that some research is being done on the self-directed learning styles and, and, you know, going deep that, yeah. and, and then through going deep on a single subject, you can learn all things, right? That you need to learn. It's pretty fascinating, I think. Yeah. So. I mean, I, I feel very fortunate. I mean, it's funny because there's a lot of things that I didn't learn that most people know, right? Like my geography sucks. I'm barely sure what conjugating a verb means. Like, you know, there, there's standard right, but, things. But you that know how to words. find that information and you know how to learn and you know how to ask good questions and deduce and induce and right and go deep, you know, to, to really master a subject. And that's not really being taught at the traditional level, you know, with the, the linear model of the past. Yeah, and I think that was the key. It was like, it wasn't about really most of my education wasn't about learning and retaining specific information. Right. It was right. about knowing how to learn right. and being able to, you know, find out what was needed as it became relevant. And I think that approach, like and for put me, it in like, the right context to make good decisions. I mean, that's right. really what education should be. Yeah. Right. A lot more of it was focused on, you know, how to learn and how to do sense making. Right. Right. Cause anyone can sort of memorize information and then be able to bring it back up. But if you don't understand it in context of everything else, that memorization has limited use. Right. And so being able to take in information in a way where you're contextualizing it against how that applies to the rest of life and, and where you actually are interested, right? Like that, right. <laughs> that was a real key was wanting to learn. Right. Um, which, which feel is the motivation factor, right? So you don't have to, be sitting there staring at a chalkboard and listening to a professor drone on or a teacher drone on about something they have no interest in. So you're going to have limited right. learning, limited recall there. I can imagine that um, learning environment that your, your parents provided combined with the meditation, which is, you know, opening up the right left hemisphere kind of connection and interplay of information and, and giving you access to that contextual awareness of, you know, the right hemispheric thinking, which is a, a byproduct of meditation mm -hmm. that that's incredible, especially in those formative years where your brain is still evolving neuroplastically, yeah. right? It's, I can see how that would really um, lead to a, a very different way of thinking. I mean, one of the things I've felt really fortunate around in my life is that, you know, I've tended to have a very strong sort of intuitive sense of things mm -hmm. much more than intellectually. Um, and I mean, I have a reasonably good intellect, but that's never been the sort of core of it. And I, I think kind of to what you were speaking, like, as I have a sort of traditional intellectual understanding of things, it's then paired with more of a right brain sort of felt sense mm -hmm. that actually ends up being what brings through a lot of the depth more so than what my intellect is able to do. Right. Yeah, I'd love to, you know, while we're, while we're talking about TM and before we get into kind of the other things that shaped you in your entrepreneurial journey, it, it, this discussion around the gut mind and the heart mind versus the brain mind and how meditation, you know, what your perspective is on how meditation kind of 
opens that up and creates this more of a whole mind or holistic thinking capacity. Whereas, um, you know, without access to that and the way we're trained in the Western world, you really end up getting kind of trapped in your head and not just in your head, but more in that left brain kind of linear cause and effect right. thinking. Well, I, mean, I think it's one of the beauties of things like meditation and breath work is, is it allows you to connect to and like really tap into and move from parts of yourself other than your head. Right. Um, because it's, it's not that the brain isn't, you know, beautiful and wonderful and like should be celebrated. It's just, it's not a complete picture of who we are. That's right. right? The being able to be guided by the heart or like a felt sense. Right. And you mentioned the gut, right? Like that, that gut instinct is so key. And most people, I think, lose a lot of that connection because we live in a world with extreme overstimulus. Right. I mean, we're always seeing screens and we're bombarded by advertising and things move at a pace that, you know, our physiology and psychology just didn't actually evolve for. Right. And so the brain then kind of goes into this like hyperactive state to be able to make sense of and orient around all of it. But the result is then you end up getting stuck in your head and you lose a lot of those other elements and it becomes necessary to have these sort of intentional slowdown practices right. um, to be able to actually both, you know, come out of the sort of hyperactivity, hypervigilant state, but also to be able to connect into the rest of who we are and be able to live as more of a full person mm -hmm. as opposed to kind of a body being guided strictly by intellect. Right. And then coming out of that hyper arousal and hyper vigilant ADHD, you know, state is actually a prerequisite to being able to tap into the, the heart wisdom and the guts, you know, instinctual warnings or, or, um, or drives. Right. And, and, and most people are hyper aroused and in a state of, you know, distress because they're always triggering that sympathetic nervous system, you know, mm -hmm the constant news feed and all the negativity and yeah i mean that's why when, when we teach box breathing like that, that really is fundamentally just to de-arouse right? to go back into kind of a more balanced homeostatic state so that you can then start to do some real inner work right right it's a it's a progression it's a prerequisite and i, and I think even this is pertains to the discussion about meditation what we found is it's probably it wasn't the case when you were learning it or your parents but today, if someone jumps right into TM or jumps right into mindfulness, they really struggle because they're in that hyper aroused state and they're radically, you know, they're just, their mind is bopping all around that, that monkey mind. Right. And they're not able to, to really um, sit calmly and to even enjoy it for a few moments. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of times the way that people try to do meditative practices is almost a little bit cruel. <laughs> um, right. It's like a goal practice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like I've, I've done it many times where it's like, I have this ideal of like, okay, I'm super stressed out. I've got way too much going on and I'm just going to like sit and meditate and go into his end state. And it doesn't fucking work. Right. Like then <laughs> I just have not. enough quietness to be that much busier. Um, and <laughs> it can really suck. <laughs> so like, you know, I, I think everyone has their different sort of approaches and practices. Like I know for me, you know, a couple of things I found that have been really helpful is one, like wherever my mind is really active or maybe looping on things that I need to address, I'll take a few minutes and I'll write them down. Mm -hmm. And like that process is like, okay, my mind can relax a little bit because I know that I'm not going to lose that information. I can come back to it when I need to. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. And then the other, which is why that basically like a little journaling practice preceding a meditation is very helpful and, and post meditation because right. then stuff comes up. Okay. That's cool. I like that. Yeah, like that's been big for me. And then the other part is moving physical energy. Like right. most of the time, if I work out before I meditate, my meditation is way better. Yes. Um, same thing with breath work, same thing with, you know, pretty much any down-regulating practice. Mm -hmm. um, if I don't do that, it depends on what state I'm going in. Sometimes I'll still have a really great experience, but you know, I've, I've spent most of my adult life running minimum of three companies at a time. Um, <laughs> so despite all the practices, like there's just a lot going on lot and going on, right? I have to do things to be able to help kind of slow that down. Cause otherwise, yeah, meditation can really suck. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. and, 
that makes a lot of sense to me. You know, I, I learned the similar thing. I mean, the, the ancient yoga practice, you know, the eight limbs of yoga, not, I don't mean like the American stretchy bendy yoga. Right. Taught that, you know, you, you move from the gross to the subtle by first training the body, moving the body, getting that energy out. And then, and then the breath is the second. So the breath is a little less gross and I don't mean disgusting gross, but you know, less material than the body's energy, but it's still movement. It's still activity. It's something you can kind of grab onto and do, right? It's an activity. Right. It goes into the action category as opposed to the non-action. And so you, you, you first move your body and then you do a breath practice to draw your attention inward. And then you let go of the breath and then you're into a meditation uh, practice. So growth to subtle in that area. And that, and that seems to work well. Cause like you said, you just, you got so much energy buildup that just needs to move. And so this works in the context of both an individual practice, like today I'm going to practice while well, I'm going to move my body, then I'm going to do some breathing, box breathing, and then I'm going to meditate. But right. it also works in the context of introducing an individual and helping them along a progression to where they can effectively meditate. First, you have to get the body uh, to be healthy and back in balance because if they're overly stressed and not sleeping well, you know, and they're burned out, then they're not meditating either, right? right. So first you work on fundamental movement, somatic practices, exercise, fueling, you know, nut nutrition, hydration, and sleep. And then we work on the breath, right? And get them to stabilize the mind with the breath and be able to concentrate. And then we move them into meditation. And then we, we do that kind of, you know, three, two, one practice of gross yeah. Gross to breath, the subtle, in in the daily practice. Well, I think that kind of thing is so critical because, like, any time you're trying to develop a new practice, you're going to have such better results when you're building on successes. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like when you dive into something totally new and you dive in maybe like too far into the deep end to start, the likelihood is it's not actually going to be a very good experience. Mm -hmm. And right. you know, like mentally, you have this ideal that it's supposed to look a certain way, but now all that ideal does is give you more room to beat yourself up for the fact that it doesn't look that way. <laughs> and so like you do this practice and you're like, Oh, this sucked. And now you're discouraged and you stop doing it. Right. And so like knowing how to sort of sequence things to be able to have really good experiences, even if the good experiences aren't as, you know, flashy or dramatic as you might want them to be or have heard. It's like having a positive experience now is like, Oh, okay. That, you know, like I felt that that was really beautiful. Let me do that again and do slightly more and then slightly right. more. It's like, and then right. that ends up being how you actually develop the ability to have sort of consistency. Right. Unless you're just a ridiculously like determined person who will just push through anything. But for most people, that's not realistic. And even right. if you can do it, it's not necessarily the best path. I agree. Fascinating. So with this um, combination of, uh, meditation and um you know kind of alternative education it's likely that you never considered a job <laughs> as a career path <laughs> i i tried once i was not good Did at you? it no <laughs> you weren't good I could imagine yeah i well, i mean i guess technically i had two jobs in my sort of later teenage years and and I mean, I was both good at them and bad at them because like I was good in the sense that I did think differently and there was a creativity that came through that allowed me to operate different than most of the people. But simultaneously, I did not follow structure and traditional authority very well. Right. And so like when I was told to do something a particular way and I'm like, there's clearly a better way to do this. Let me do it this other way. And I wasn't allowed to. It was just profoundly frustrating. Um and so, yeah, I mean, definitely working for other people was not something that I was designed for. Right. Um, <laughs> and so, I mean, I, I ended up going into a more entrepreneurial direction pretty young. Like I started my first company at 17 wow. and it was, you know, a small business. But, you know, at 18, I ended up uh, taking over a vocational college that taught alternative medicine and psychology. Amazing. And, you know, spent most of 10 years doing that. Um, and I, I was not even remotely equipped to do something of that significance at that age. So it was mm -hmm. stupid hard. Mm -hmm. Um, and I caused a decent amount of damage to myself in the first few years, trying to develop skill faster than I was really able to. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was still 
like as much as it was hard, it was also beautiful because I was able to be doing work that I was really passionate about. Right? Like particular, I mean, the whole gamut, but like particularly for me, the sort of psychology, personal development side was always where the most intrigue came from. Because mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. though I do care a lot about physiological health and wanting to help people with being able to, you know, both overcome challenges and enhance physiology, mm -hmm. my sort of understanding intellectually, but more so like my intuitive sense throughout life has always been that the majority of challenge and suffering is more the psycho-emotional level. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And even where there are clear physiological causes to things, the ability to do what it takes to address those becomes a million times easier when you have addressed a lot of the blockages or resistance to doing the work. Right. Um, I agree with that. And so like that piece was, it was and has always been kind of the, the core for me. Um, did you have a mentor or, you know, how did you navigate, you know, going from zero and, and to running a, a school basically? Like, how did you, I know you said yeah. it was painful, but <laughs> what helped <laughs> you get through it? <laughs> no, I mean, I, I was really fortunate. Um, I, so I sort of had two mentors in that process. Um, one was, a bit more of a business mentor um, when I was trying to figure out how to raise money to buy the college. Uh, one of the people I got introduced to was this sort of older retired CPA mm -hmm. um, who, you know, for whatever reason came, you know, really liked me and was willing to put up some of the money. Um, but his condition was if I put up the money, I'm in control of the finances and I'll teach you what I'm doing along the way. Oh, that's cool. Um, yeah. And I was like, great. I don't even know how to do them anyways. I can't balance a checkbook. So like he ended up being a you know, fairly meaningful mentor for me on sort of the business side, being able to talk through and understand, you know, how business worked, how finances worked, how to make decisions. Um, but then also the, the man who had founded the school I took over um, was really my sort of primary mentor in life. Um, mm -hmm. His name was Dr. Barry Green. Mm -hmm. And he was sort of known as one of the grandfathers of holistic medicine um, okay. and you know, had been working in the field for God, almost 40 years okay. uh, and just had an incredible depth of not just knowledge, but real embodiment of mm -hmm. everything. Like he was, a, he was someone who did all of the practices very diligently, you know, did Tai Chi every day for probably at least 25 years by the time I met him. Wow. Um, and you know, it developed new processes around doing psycho-emotional clearing. And um, so, you know, he he had founded the school and, you know, owned it and was doing a lot of the coursework. And right around the time I was graduating from there was when he had said he wanted to sort of semi-retire. He still wanted to teach, but he didn't want to be on the business side. So I ended up taking over the business. And, you know, but then I, I did another almost five years of, like pretty intensive study with him after I had finished the core curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, and then beyond that, just, you know, continued to do work as it arose. Um, but he was like, he was very much like a second father for me and you know, served a huge role in my life. Um, helping, you know, like I had a really beautiful upbringing and childhood in many ways, but it was also very experimental, which in some ways was kind of disastrous. And so he was a lot of, he was the main person who kind of helped me work through a lot of the traumas and challenges of early childhood. Um, and also, disastrous because trying to fit that back into mainstream is very challenging, I imagine. Right. Oh, for sure. Right. So we're, yeah. on, we're on, you know, we're on peg in a square hole or, or vice square peg <laughs> in a round hole. Yeah. <laughs> way. Right. Fascinating. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, he was, he was really my main mentor and, you know, served a huge role in my life. Um, and he, he passed away about probably three and a half years or so ago now, but, you know, we, we were closely connected for 20, almost 20 years. Hmm. Um, and what a blessing to have someone like that. Yeah. So yeah, what no, happened after, uh, did you sell this? Was it a successful, you know, endeavor in terms of like a business exit and that kind of thing? It's yeah, cool. I mean, it was it was reasonably successful. You know, like I said, I knew nothing about business when I started. So, mm -hmm. you know, the first portion was kind of challenging. But as it went on, you know, over the like nine, nine and a half years, I ran it about 
we grew the company by about three times from mm -hmm. where I had taken it over. Um, and I eventually did sell it. I was still in love with the work, but I'd kind of hit roadblocks where I wanted to start to evolve the curriculum based on things that I had been studying. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we were accredited by multiple government bodies and a lot of things I wanted to teach weren't things that could be quantified in very traditional senses. So I couldn't get them approved. Mm -hmm. um, so ended up deciding to step away. And uh, from there, I ended up moving into the cannabis space, which was mm -hmm. sort of unexpected for me. Mm -hmm. uh, wasn't something that was on my radar at all. But towards the last part of my time at the school, a lot of the teachers that were in like the nutrition and herbology department were starting to tell me about the medical effects of cannabis. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I just thought they were full of shit and trying to come up with a good reason to get high. Um, <laughs> but like, as I started to look at it, I was like, okay, the, nope, I, you know, there's actually something here. Something here. Um, and so I, I started a dispensary in 2009 uh, here in San Diego. And then pretty quickly after that, got pulled really deep into the industry. Um, mm -hmm. I had, when I first started working with patients, you know, I came to see how impactful cannabis actually could be for healing all kinds of challenges and like how profound of a difference in quality of life. But especially back then, the stigma was still incredibly strong. And so all Are these you talking people, primarily of CBD or both THC and CBD? Uh, both. It both. was, you know, it depended on the, you know, kind of what condition somebody was dealing with. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously we would err on the side of CBD and other non-psychoactives as much as possible, mm -hmm. but you know, for a lot of things like, you know, severe anxiety or insomnia or certain kinds of like, uh, neurological pain, THC was just vastly more effective. Mm. Um, but you know, the, the thing that really stood out for me and I think what really pulled me into the industry in a much deeper way was seeing how beneficial it was paired with how terrified people were to let anyone know that they were using cannabis as a medicine. <laughs> right. Um, and, you know, as I started to see that, I was like, okay, this isn't okay. Clearly the world needs to understand the topic better. Right. Um, and so I started doing some public education work, which pretty quickly turned into producing a documentary about the medical effects of cannabis. And I had no idea what was going to come from that, but it turned out that it went viral. I didn't know what viral was at the time. Um, <laughs> what year are we talking about now? This was 2011 that we released the film. Okay. Got it. Um, what was yeah. that called, by the way? That film was called Medicinal Cannabis and Its Impact on Human Health. Okay. Not the sexiest title that ever happened. <laughs> that sounds uh, like a subtitle. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it was, there was already a number of documentaries out at the time, but they were all designed more for people who were already pro-cannabis and mm -hmm. they had you know people with dreadlocks and more counterculture. And like, my thing was, I wasn't trying to make it sexy. I was trying to make it compelling for people who were either on the fence or who were anti and so we only featured extremely credentialed researchers out of major universities that, you know, actually in all circumstances had had federal funding for their research, mm -hmm, which was mm -hmm. not common. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was, it was a little on the dull side, but it w provided a lot of education in a very short period of time. Um, and, you know, after that thing started kind of taking off and going around the world, then what happened was I started getting emails from thousands of people all over saying, okay, I saw the film, my mind's changed. I want to be able to use you know, cannabis for my child with epilepsy or my partner with cancer or whatever mm -hmm. it was, but I live in a place where it's illegal. What do I do? Mm -hmm. And so I was like, shit, okay, now we have to work on policy. Mm -hmm. um, so then I ended up getting heavily into the policy side sort of later in 2011, 2012. Um, formed an industry trade association, formed a political action committee, started pooling together industry resources to try to drive new legislation mm -hmm. and spent about seven years really actively in the political side of that working that on at a state level or federal or both. It was mostly at more at a state level. I, mm -hmm. there was a couple of things I worked on at a federal level, but there wasn't a lot of mechanisms to be able to do anything at a federal level at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, I did participate in suing the Department of Justice at one point to try to say, change some policies. Um, I don't recommend that. It wasn't. I was going to say, I'm sure that didn't go over very well. It didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I've been more ambitious and intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> right. Tell me about that. You you mentioned this story, which was just mind blowing, with the uh, DEA um, getting involved. 
trying to shut you down. Oh yeah, that was that was an interesting and pretty terrifying experience. Um, that was so I, I had written a piece of legislation um, just in a local city here. It wasn't even at a state level, and we were we were trying to get a bill passed, um, and the city was so adamantly against it, and right. so they had tried all kinds of things to make it to where the bill couldn't proceed, um, and but you know like. I had a really good team. So we had dotted our I's, crossed our T's. They couldn't find any like process faults to be able to shut it down. Um, and so I was at one of the city council meetings one time and um, I ended up in the back of the room seeing this guy in you know, what must have been like a five or $7,000 suit. Like it, it was clearly mm -hmm. out of place for mm -hmm. where we were. Um, and at the end of the, and, and I was like confused as to who he was. And at the end of the meeting, he came up to me and apparently he was the head of the DEA for, I think it was for California at the time, mm -hmm. um, but whatever it was, high, high ranking. Um, and he sort of alluded to the fact that if I continued down this path, I might get to, you know, experience the hospitality of the federal government by spending a number of years behind bars. Um, <laughs> Just outright threat. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, you know, he was smart. So it was, it was tactically done, um, right. but it was, it, I mean, yeah, it scared the living fuck out of me because he actually had the authority to pull things off if he wanted to, despite yeah. whether or not that was legal or ethical. Um, and luckily, they hadn't actually shut the cameras off in the city council halls yet. Mm -hmm. They so were supposed the to, but the meeting had ended. Um, but so the thing ended up getting caught on camera, ended up being able to use that. Um, I was doing some work with the ACLU at the time. And so they got the footage and kind of helped shut it down. And there was never any follow-up repercussions <laughs> that came. But I, I was like actively shaking when that happened. The, ir the irony in that whole thing for me, and I never thought of, I didn't think about this the first time I heard the story, is that um, the DEA does not pay enough to have a $5,000 suit, right? <laughs> It's there. possible this guy was getting a little on the side, but with some of his kingpins. You know, uh, I came across that stuff a lot when I was working in politics, whether it was like people in different government positions or like sometimes you would collaborate on different political campaigns with like unions or other major groups. And a lot of the people who were in charge, I'm like, you live a lifestyle that is not supported by right. Yeah. the kinds of income that are supposed to come from public office. Like, I, yeah. I don't know what's happening, but clearly something is. Well, you do know what's happening, but it's uh, yeah. proving it. I don't say know the specifics, thing. but you can kind of figure it out along the way. <laughs> it's, it's kind <laughs> of uh, become a little bit of an epidemic, I think, in our government right now. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. No, I mean, that was one of the reasons why, like, I was really happy to be in politics for a number of years because we were able to make a lot of impact. Mm -hmm. But it was hard, and I did not enjoy it because the level of corruption and was just intense and and it was systematic like one of the things that changed in my view as i got deeper into it because a lot of people are like oh people become politicians because they are evil and they want control mm -hmm. and that actually wasn't what i found most of the time there, no, there was elements true, of that yeah. but a lot of the people i saw come in came in with really good beautiful intentions and get sort of systematically broken down over the course of a few years mm -hmm. Because there would always be these situations where it's like, oh, there's this thing you believe in that you really want to do. Well, if you'll sign off on this thing, I'll give you this favor to help in your direction. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you end up having to do these sort of gray area yeah. cost benefit analysis. Um, and, you know, some of them are pretty clear, some of them aren't, but over time, it just sort of degrades. And there's so much information being poured at you that it becomes really hard to actually make sense of anything right like if you look at a federal level just the pharmaceutical industry alone has on average 11 full-time lobbyists per member of congress right mm -hmm. so insane. they have 11 really educated highly yeah. paid highly trained people whose whole job is yeah. how do i spin a narrative to make this person who has decision authority think a certain thing right so even oh, if and, the, and, the, and on the flip side, they're they're doing the same thing with you know research community and what gets funded, what doesn't get funded, you know, right. outright manipulation of you know information, right? It's, yeah, I, I, mean, I read a stat uh, today actually that the the top ten pharma companies ha have more 
profit than the, than the collective of the Fortune 500, than the totality of the Fortune 500. Profit. That could be. I, I, I don't know that, cool. but that would not surprise me from what I've right. seen. <laughs> like, people don't realize the degree of influence. Like, you know, most scholarships for med school students are funded by pharma companies. Most right. buildings that are built on medical schools are funded by pharmaceutical companies. Like, so they have an incredible degree of influence over the nature of education. And this mm -hmm. is why, like, if you become a doctor, depending on the nature of like the kind of practice you go into, for the most part, there's either no requirement or maybe a requirement of up to about 20 hours of nutritional training right. out of a eight or 12 year education. Um, whereas there's mind boggling thousands of hours of education on medications and surgeries. Right. Um, and I'm not an anti-pharma person. Like I think there's really brilliant applications of allopathic medicine, mm -hmm. but the problem is the way that information is sort of distorted. Um, and everything is just too emphasized in one particular it's, direction. It's become a first resort instead of a last resort, unfortunately. Right. And it shouldn't be, right? Because the whole standard model of allopathic medicine is the treatment of disease. Right. And ideally, we shouldn't be waiting to get to the level of disease. There's right. so much work in the realm of preventative medicine right. and in the realm of optimization mm -hmm. right, that can avert the necessity for a lot of the treatment of symptoms right um now if you're at a place where you've got severe symptoms sometimes western medicine's amazing right like when i crashed a motorcycle and broke my arm i didn't like my first thought was not you're not gonna eat a banana right <laughs> or an right. apple it's too late like i did do some anti-inflammatory supplements and you know things but like i went to the doctor and got it set and put a cast on like right. and that was perfect um right. but it, there's just things go f in that direction way too much. Yeah. And that was part of my, it was at least one of the drivers in wanting to start Neurohacker mm -hmm. was being able to take the very best of, you know, sort of cutting edge preventative medicine and, you know, particularly optimization and advance it in such a way and apply enough research to it that we could start to bring real credibility to that space more so than had previously existed. And mm -hmm. there's already a lot there, but, you know, we took an approach that allowed us to sort of design and quantify research in a way that the sort of standard medical model was a bit more accustomed to looking at it. Right. So. Yeah. That's when I first met you is when you, you know, were, were forming Neurohacker with your brother, mm -hmm. Daniel and, um, and Jordan. Yep. Uh, so that was about what six years ago, or when, when did you start Neurohacker? Yeah, I mean, we—I guess we started going in market about five and a half, six years ago. Um, but we spent almost two years before that just doing pure R and D before we actually turned mm -hmm. it into a company. Because mm -hmm. um, the nature of what we were trying to do really required a fairly insane amount of research to even kick it off. I bet. Yeah, I think that's um, you know, I'd love to talk a little bit about. Qualia and um, and kind of your innovations there, but I, I I use the product every day, well five times a week or so as prescribed. I use your uh, uh, um, Qualia Mind and Qualia Life, the former Eternus product. I think yep. they're just brilliant. So first, you you kind of want, had this vision to really um, create a premier nootropic that you know that solved a lot of issues, right? And so it's it's not a it's not a cheap product because there's so much that you've done with it, right? So so. Tell me about that and then how that whole, that line extended to, you know, cause it's almost like if you can get the brain healthy and then we, then we can start to work on, on longevity and, and now, you know, actually reversing aging, right? Reversing senescence. Right. And I think that's fascinating. So give us kind of like the linkages and how that whole path has developed and where we're at today. Yeah. I mean, so like with Neurohacker, the, the thing that, I would say is probably most unique about the company is the the sort of model of science that we've worked to pioneer, which is, you know, we took complex system science and applied it to the study of human physiology. Right. And to the best of my knowledge, no one else was doing that. And it, it's still not particularly common. Um, but, you know, taking this complex systems approach allowed us to understand physiological systems at a level of detail and nuance that for the most part, people just weren't looking at, mm -hmm. uh, but also through a fundamentally different lens, right? What the nature of that was, was 
recognition that there's an innate brilliance in our biology right. and that a lot of the ways that medicine has traditionally worked, whether allopathy or even most alternative forms of medicine, there's this orientation to override natural physiology and say, oh, you know, you're having this particular issue. You need more of X. Let's give that to you. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, oftentimes that approach can have short-term benefits, but it usually creates long-term harm because now the body is operating out of balance. Mm -hmm. And so our approach was to say, let's understand how the system is designed to optimally work if it's not under excessive stress and challenge and hardship. And then factor the excessive stress and challenge and hardship and see what are the kinds of nutrients that we need to provide to be able to get it back into balance, right? So mm -hmm. the first goal is how do we bring the system into homeostasis? And then from homeostasis, how do we do what we refer to as increasing homeostatic capacity? Mm -hmm. right? So first bring it into balance and then increase capacity while staying in balance. Right. And so like when you look at it in the cognitive domain, you know, like the majority of things in the cognitive space some of them work on different neural pathways, but the most common would be dopamine. Mm -hmm. And so people are like, oh, increase dopamine and you'll get more focus and attention span. And it's true. But if you increase dopamine too much where it's disproportionate with the other neurotransmitters, you'll have a really great near-term effect. And over time, it'll start to create other imbalances and can have, at the same time that you become more focused and more driven, it can decrease things like discernment and critical thinking. Mm -hmm. um, Interesting. And so our approach was, you know, we're not trying to specifically create more or less of anything. We want your body to be able to do that in relationship to what it's exposed to. Mm -hmm. So there are times where you need more dopamine. There are times where you need more serotonin or oxytocin or whatever it is. And by helping to bring the system into homeostasis and give it what it needs, your body can actually naturally respond to those things and be able to produce more or less of what's needed in real time. Right. And so one of the things that's been really neat to see with, I mean, all of our products, but particularly the cognitive one, because that's what's been out longest and has the most research, is how broad the nature of benefits are, right? right. It's not just improvements in thinking process or processing speed or things like that. It's you know, like a lot of my favorite testimonials actually have very little to do with the way that people would traditionally think of cognition. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are people saying, I'm so much more present than I used to be. Like I can look in my kid's eyes and feel them in a way that I never could before. In addition to I'm way more motivated. I'm not procrastinating anymore. I am remembering things that I didn't remember, you know, like all of those are great. And for me, a lot of the most exciting is like, how do you increase presence and connection, um, right. which are all things that are mediated through the brain and nervous system. Hmm. And so we started with cognition partly because it was something that we were like, hey, almost everyone needs cognitive support. Either mm -hmm. there's an area where they're suffering um, and they need to get back to what they had previously experienced, or they just want to optimize right, and be able mm -hmm. to have more of a cutting edge capacity to really show up to life fully. Mm -hmm. um, so part of it was just a broad need, but part of it was also that if your brain isn't working well, everything else is much harder. Right. Right. We all know that we're supposed to exercise regularly, make good dietary choices, you know, have a consistent sleep schedule, all these things. Mm -hmm. But when you're just stressed out and exhausted and sort of mentally suffering, it's really hard to motivate to do those things. Right. So when you start by addressing cognitive and getting to a place where you have clarity, you have vision of what's necessary, you have the drive to be able to act on it. Not only do you get the benefits from that, but you get to leverage that into all of the other aspects of health. Mm -hmm. So we started with cognition and that was really the core focus for probably about the first three years. Mm -hmm. um, and then as we kind of expanded into that domain, we you know, decided to take the same complex systems model and start applying it to other aspects of physiology. Mm -hmm. um, and we went into you know, kind of as the next main phase was sort of anti-aging medicine. Right. Um, we developed the product you just mentioned called Qualia Life, which mm -hmm. is really designed to improve the health of cells at a very fundamental level, yeah. right? It's working off of a number of different pathways. The one that we've studied most extensively in relationship to it is NAD. 
Mm -hmm. um, right? And NAD is the primary sort of fuel source for cells. Mm -hmm. um, it's where they derive energy and what allows for healthy cellular metabolism, cellular reproduction. Um, and, you know, we, we took a very sort of different and novel approach to how we did that. Um, that's turned out to be really beautiful, right? The, the pilot study we did on that product showed after 30 days of being on the product that people's NAD levels increased by a full hundred percent in their blood. Wow. Um, and that's significantly more than anything else that's on the market. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it's because we are taking a more complex approach. We're not using a single precursor to create more NAD. We're using multiple things that hit on multiple different pathways to be able to kind of work in conjunction with how the body's designed to. Mm -hmm. um, so this product is is not an anti-aging. It's just a you you put in the longevity category because by giving your cells more energy, then technically speaking, they're going to slow down the breakdown process, and right. and and also you'll have more energy to do the healthy things that that your body needs to, you know, stay yeah, I mean, fit it's... and give you a nice lifespan or right. health span, like... yeah that product hits on a number of the key things that are studied and known in relationship to longevity. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, in that regard, it's a longevity product, but really it's more than that. Like it's, I mean, obviously I'm biased, right? Cause I, mm -hmm. <laughs> I built the company, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I think it's probably the best like foundational health product that I've ever seen because when you are addressing health at the cellular level and m giving the cells what they need to be able to, function optimally, everything gets better, right? So rather than having to address individual tissues or organs, like the whole thing is going to improve in a very material sense. Um, and so, you know, that's been just a really awesome product that is, I mean, we expected it to do quite a lot of good things. It's actually outperformed some of what the expectations were mm -hmm. and it led us to move deeper into that path. Like, and we've, mm -hmm. we've done products in, you know, sleep and immunity and a number of things, but we have been starting to put progressively more resources into things in and around the like longevity and foundational health space. Mm -hmm. um, you know, most recently, actually like, God, only like seven or eight weeks ago, we just launched a new product called Qualia Senolytic. Mm -hmm. And that product is designed to be able to essentially kill off and get rid of senescent cells. And now like mm -hmm. this is the very cutting edge of longevity medicine right now. Right. Most people have never heard of senescent cells. I, right. I, I think I literally just became aware of that term maybe in the last year or so. Explain. Yeah, I, mean, I only heard about it when my research team came to me and said, Hey, there's this interesting thing. Can we work on it? <laughs> <laughs> um, I had no clue and I've spent a lot of my life in the space, but um, yeah, I mean, senescent cells, if you know, for those who aren't familiar is healthy cells are able to continue to divide and reproduce. And then when they get to a place where they're not able to, a process kicks in called apoptosis where they die off, right? Mm -hmm. it, it means essentially uh, scheduled die off. Mm -hmm. and so cells are supposed to be able to reproduce when they hit end of life, they die and they get removed from the body. Um, but as we age, certain functions around apoptosis, around immune function start to kind of decrease and some cells become what are known as senescent where they're, or the more sort of common term for it is zombie cells yeah. right? because they're still alive in the sense that like they're still there, they're taking up space, they're taking up resources, but they're not really providing the benefit. They can no longer divide, but they're also not dying off. Hmm. And similar to zombies, it's not just the effect of them. It's, you know, like how a zombie will eat somebody else's brains and they become a zombie. Well, these <laughs> senescent cells excrete these proteins that right. turn other cells around them to become senescent. Interesting. And so it ends up having this downward spiral effect because as so you- it accelerates the aging process. Yeah. Exactly. Right? So as we get older, we build up more senescent cells. And then because we're not able to get rid of them the way that we ideally should, they then turn more cells senescent and it just speeds up the whole process. Wow. Um, and so this is like the very, the very cutting edge right now of what most longevity research is going into is how do you get rid of excessive senescent cells? 
-hmm. Some amount in the body is natural and fine, but when they start to build up too much, that's when you start to have all kinds of issues associated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is an incredibly new area. Like researchers have known about senescent cells for a few decades, mm -hmm. but it was maybe 12 or 15 years ago that we started to understand that different kinds of stressors and environmental toxins and et cetera could actually increase the number of them. And it was only in 2015 that the first research came out of a combination of Mayo Clinic and Scripps that showed that anything could actually be done about it. Hmm. Right? So we knew about them. We didn't know that you could actually get rid of them. And then a number of you know, quite large scale studies were done, uh, particularly with a drug called the Statinib combined with a supplement called Quercetin that showed the ability to reduce the number of senescent cells meaningfully. Hmm. Um, and there's still tremendous amounts of research going into that. Um, you know, given well, our approach and the nature of what we do, we don't work with drugs. So we, you know, we kind of scoured all of the studies that have ever been done on the topic and looked at what are all of the different compounds that are known to be able to reduce senescent cells and particularly look at it in rel relationship to senescent cells in different parts of the body, mm -hmm. right? because all types of cells can become senescent but different compounds will affect, you know, senescent cells in fat more than in the brain or muscle mm -hmm. or et cetera. So again, as, as we do, we took this sort of complex approach and used, uh, in this case, nine different ingredients that all have meaningful research showing their ability to target and kill off senescent cells. Um, each mm -hmm. one having more emphasis on particular types of cells. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you this, know, how will you know if it's successful? Are fewer well, zombies walking around? I mean, what's the, <laughs> what's the stuff we're looking for? Yeah, it's, it's a bit tricky right now because it's so new. Like the main way that in lab settings, this is tested is to actually biopsy tissues, right? right. And so you look at in a lab, the number of senescent cells before and after some kind of treatment. Mm -hmm. um, but most people don't want to have multiple parts of their body biopsied. Um, right. So instead what you do is you look at what are the kinds of effects of built up senescence and then you do measurements against those effects so mm -hmm. like we did um, brand new products we've only had a chance to do one study so far but we recently completed a pilot study where we were looking at um, joint discomfort and um, you know, essentially joint mobility, right? The ability mm -hmm. to do regular activities with or without pain. Um, and so with this particular study, we had uh, nine people who had moderate degrees of joint related pain um, mm -hmm. and had them do uh, these, a series of these, what are known as validated questionnaires, questionnaires that have already been determined to be able to be an effective measurement against particular right. kinds of issues. Um, and so, you know, they did a baseline one before they ever started, and then they did three rounds of this product um, and did, you know, questionnaires after each round. And I mean, the results were way better than I even expected. Um, mm. And I tend to be pretty optimistic, but you know, what we found there was 50, out of the whole group, there was a 51% reduction in challenges with daily activity hmm. and a 53% reduction in joint discomfort. Do you uh, think these senescent cells are um, causing inflammation? Is that what leads to inflammation? It's in the part body? of it. I mean, there, there's a lot of things that cause inflammation, mm -hmm. um, but senescence does have a link there. Interesting. Um, wow, that sounds very promising. Yeah, it's it's a very cool area. I mean, I'm still getting to understand a lot of the deeper elements of it. You're, and you're taking these products too, because you're actually like 85 and you look like what, 40 <laughs> or something? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm you know we we just came out with the product, so I've only like this particular one is taken two days a month. Um, so it's more like Got a it. cleanse than a daily product. Uh, oh, that's actually what the research shows, and it, it's interesting because there's a few other supplements on the market for addressing senescence but most of them are taken daily. And the way that the research has shown is that um, what, what's usually referred to as sort of a hit and run approach is actually most effective, um, where you take relatively high doses periodically, kill off a large number of senescent cells, and then give the body a break and then mm -hmm. do it again. So the nature of what we designed is 
two days in a row per month. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I've done two cycles so far. Um, I will do my third cycle in about two weeks, Mm -hmm. but I mean, even after two cycles, I'm definitely noticing a difference in terms of less joint pain and sort of tightness Mm -hmm. and a speed up in recovery time. I'm going to check that out. So is there any um, particular age where it's good to take this? I mean, I wouldn't imagine like an 18 year old needs to take. You know, I mean, in essence, uh, yeah, I mean, the older that we something. are, the more senescent cells are built up. Um, and so it becomes progressively more important. Mm-hmm. But like with many things in the longevity space, the earlier you start them, the mm. longer the benefit stretches out. Right. Um, like our uh, Dr. Greg Kelly, who's our lead formulator, um, I was just talking to him and he was saying that, you know, the last many years he's had an incredibly healthy lifestyle, but when he was younger and he was in the Navy, he, you know, didn't sleep at all. He had like, you know, rotating shifts between day and night, um, had, you know, terrible diet, terrible, all kinds of things. And, you know, he thinks that a lot of his senescent cells actually potentially built up in the body in his twenties and then just Hmm. stayed. Um, and it wasn't until much later as he started to understand it and be able to get rid of them that he's like, Oh, now I'm seeing huge benefits. Um, and that, you know, the research on that is, is still unclear. We don't know definitively how long senescent cells exist in the body. Mm -hmm. Um, but there is reason to believe that they can be there for a long time. Mm -hmm. So, no, I mean, I, I would say I, Ideally, you know, people starting this kind of thing in their 20s or at least 30s would have a huge impact. Mm -hmm. Um, They won't probably have as much of a subjective effect as someone Mm -hmm. who starts taking it in their 50s or 60s or later Mm -hmm. uh, because there's the total buildup of cellular senescence isn't quite as high. But it's, it's then also going to make it to where, you know, they have more years ahead of them before there starts to be build up. Right, right. Same well, what's your, with, sorry about that. Go ahead. Same thing with quality of life, right? Like right. the people who notice it most tend to be a little bit older, right. but there's no age at which you don't want your cells to be healthier. You don't want your mitochondria to have more energy. Mm-hmm. Um, so like right. when you right. start those things earlier, you have sort of maximum benefit. Right. And we're like, and, and you're also <clears throat> have the, um, the benefit of not only increasing your lifespan, but being healthy during that those older years, right? Which is really a key, you know, a key kind of objective of yours, I think is like, it's one thing to live to 110 or have this idea that we're gonna live to 110 or 120, but, but we want to be healthy and and active and, you know, and have, you know, all of our capabilities. Yeah. I mean, I care more about what I refer to as health span than lifespan, right? right? Like, yeah, it'd be cool to live to 150. um, But, you know, I mean, the way that most people are like the last 15, 20 years of their life is got a lot of struggle and pain associated Mm -hmm. and even if you don't extend lifespan at all but you're happy and healthy and thriving throughout the duration of time Mm -hmm. that you're on the planet that to me is the the key focus yeah i'd much rather live to 70 or 80 and be really happy and healthy the whole time than live to 90 or 100 and spend the last 20 years suffering what what is your belief about the limits of you know human age it's possible in at least our lifetimes or someone listening who might be 20. Right. You know, I mean, it's interesting. There's, there's so much conflicting info out there, but I mean, I, there's sort of what are the limits of biology as we understand it today Mm -hmm. versus what's possible as we continue to have more capacity to manipulate biology. Um, Right. So in terms of just, what the body can naturally do if being well taken care of. I suspect that life expectancy between 120 and 150 is very viable. Mm -hmm. Um, And a lot of the research I've seen into some of the more cutting edge things where you're getting into like gene manipulation indicate the ability to look at lifespans, you know, well past 200. Um, How Mm -hmm. quickly we get there is a question mark, but there's, you know, there's a lot of things that are moving at ridiculously fast paces where, Mm -hmm. you know, it's probable in my view that people who are, you know, born in the last handful of years could very well have access to the types of technologies that would allow for 
150, 200 plus year kinds of lifespans. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Which is both exciting and terrifying. Right. Right. It's like at many different changer levels. For practically everything, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, like personally, I would love that because, you know, every five or 10 years that pass, I'm like, wow, I was an idiot five or 10 years ago. I've learned so right. much more since then, right? right. Like the yeah. number of multiples of that I get to experience sounds really exciting. <laughs> but then when you start to think about, you know, a lot of the bigger implications of that with, you know, if reproduction rates don't decrease in proportion to longevity, mm -hmm. now you have all kinds of issues with overpopulation, resource management, mm -hmm. um, and it just, it starts to get into some really deep moral questions of how right. that type of thing is navigated. Right. Um, that is way beyond my scope of expertise, but things that I, you know, am interested in thinking about sometimes. Right. That's awesome. What's, um, what's the overall objective, uh, for the business of Neurohacker? I mean, you're CEO, are you going to stay CEO forever and sell the company or, you know, what's, what's the future look like? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's always hard to predict the future, but I mean, as I can see it right now, I plan on staying CEO for you know, probably at least the number of years ahead. I mm -hmm. like for me, it's, I care a lot more about the mission of Neurohacker than I do my role. Mm -hmm. um, so if it came to a point where someone could do a better job than me, I'd happily hand it over. But mm -hmm. as it stands right now, I still have a you know, sort of unique understanding and competency in the space that allows me to be very useful. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, the mission of Neurohacker is really to optimize human capacity. Um, mm -hmm. And that's both at a physiological level, be able to improve health and optimize all different systems. But also like a lot of what we do is, is not just health related. We get into you know, different layers of education, um, you know, where we're doing a lot of content around um, existential risk and future mm -hmm. of civilization. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's optimizing at the individual level, but also the collective level. Yeah. Um, and that's what your brother Daniel is really passionate about as well. Right. That piece the whole the systems at a cultural and global level. Yeah. Yeah. It's I mean, he clearly had a very big influence on that part of the business. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Fascinating stuff. Um, I'm excited to see uh, the company develop. I'm a big fan and, and, uh, excited to try your uh, Senolytic product. Mm. And um, so so where can folks learn more about you and the company? It's probably the Neurohacker website, right? Yeah. Yeah. Best place is just neurohacker.com. Okay. Um, there's, I mean, tremendous. You got a great, you got a great blog and a great, you know, podcast series. There's all sorts of tremendous information on the website. So it's a really very helpful tool and community. You've, you've created a community out of the whole yeah, no, I, I feel really fortunate with what's come together. You know, we, you know, we started off by just sort of taking away a lot of the limitations of research and mm -hmm. saying, hey, we're not going to make you do research for a specific outcome in a specific time frame mm -hmm. and at a specific budget. We're like, we're going to actually open up the doors to be able to do proper research and to see where it goes and whatever is best is what we're going to execute on. Mm -hmm. And that allowed us to bring in a ridiculous level of scientific talent. And then that attracted a lot more people. And like, at this point, we've got an extraordinary and, you know, somewhat cult like following of people who are just really devoted to the kinds of research and work and education. Mm -hmm. um, and it's allowed us to you know, bring in brilliant thinkers across all kinds of domains, not just health, but, you know, psychology, personal development, mm -hmm. future of civilization, systems right. design. Um, so I'm, yeah, I'm really delighted with what has developed so far and particularly excited to see what we can continue to make happen over the next several years. Yeah, I am too. And clearly you're, you're optimistic about the future and you know, we wouldn't be pushing so hard in this direction. <laughs> right. What What is your vision for the future in the next 10, let's just 10 years? <laughs> I mean, this is always a funny one because like I, I have spent a decent amount of time studying existential risk. And when you look at the kinds of problems that are facing the world, there really isn't a picture you can come to other than saying we're fucked. Um, <laughs> right. So, uh, you know, I get that. And, you know, one of one of the people I learned from a lot growing up was Buckminster Fuller. And he has this yeah. concept mm -hmm. of emergence through emergency. Mm -hmm. right? And that's 
a lot of times the greatest innovation only comes from absolute emergency and you can't see what that innovation is going to look like ahead of time. That's right. So even though a lot of the data points to the idea that we're looking at all kinds of issues of, you know, environmental collapse, civilization, disasters, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think some of that will come to pass. Mm -hmm. Um, but I have a deep sort of, I don't know, for lack of a better way of saying it, faith that, um, all of the brilliant, wonderful people who are working on solution sets will come up with things well beyond the scope of what is predictable today. That's right. Um, and that, you know, collectively all of the work that, you know, we're each doing to raise consciousness, to develop deeper connection, deeper community will change what appears to be the current course for something that is much, much more beautiful. Yeah. Well said. I'll bet on humanity as well. Yeah. In the long run. James, thanks so much for your time today. It's been a, a real honor and very, very enlightening. And um, let us know how we can support you and, and we'll um, go forth and do great things. Thank you. Stay yeah. healthy. <laughs> Appreciate you having me on. I, I always love our conversations. So this, this was great. Definitely. All right. Take care. Hope Thank you. you Bye.